Good day. We're now roughly a week away from the start of the current crisis in the Middle East with the extraordinary attack Hamas launched on settlements in southern Israel, which is accompanied by a massive loss of life and systematic attacks, and this has to be said, systematic, brutal and extremely violent attacks on civilians. And this has, of course, created a political crisis in Israel. It has led to the formation of the National Unity Government, an announcement of Israel being in a state of war, and the preparations for what continues to look increasingly like an offensive against Gaza, which is, of course, the city, the enclave in which Hamas is based. And there have been extremely heavy Israeli airstrikes on Gaza, um, airstrikes which have undoubtedly led to the loss of hundreds of civilian lives. There are reports that, in fact, the death toll from these uh, bombing strikes are roughly a thousand. If we put together the deaths in Israel with the deaths in Gaza, we have already had a war, because to all intents and purposes, that is what it is, in which thousands of people, soldiers, Hamas fighters, but many, many civilians have lost their lives. And if there is an Israeli, a full-scale Israeli advance into Gaza, well, of course, the number of civilians who will die will spiral. And the great majority of those will be Palestinians. Now, over the last few hours, when I um, started following the news this morning, checking on the news this morning, I was reading that Secretary of State Blinken, who has been in Israel, supposedly had issued calls for restraint. And in fact, there continue to be reports to that effect in the Financial Times. And these are some of Secretary Blinken's words as the um, Financial Times has reported them. He said, it's, it says that uh, um, Blinken called on Israel to take steps to avoid civilian casualties at a press conference on Thursday with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Blinken also reiterated a warning to other regional actors not to take advantage of the crisis to attack Israel amid concerns that a broader conflict would draw in Iranian-backed militant groups in Lebanon, Syria and elsewhere. Israel has the right, indeed the obligation, to defend itself and to ensure that this never happens again, said Blinken. How Israel does this matters. We democracies distinguish ourselves from terrorists by striving for a different standard. That's why it's so important to take every possible precaution to avoid harming civilians. Well, that is what Blinken said. And I should say that after days of passivity from the administration, we now have information that after his trips to um, Israel and Jordan, Secretary of State Blinken now does intend to extend his trip, his tour of the Middle East, to include such countries as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. Qatar, by the way, and for the record, has been the major Arab regional backer of Hamas, and I suspect and believe that financial aid to um, Hamas from Qatar, an extremely rich Gulf uh, Kingdom, Arab Gulf Kingdom, I suspect that its funding for Hamas has been significantly greater than whatever financial assistance Hamas has received from Iran, Qatar having exceptionally deep pockets and, being, and having a history 
of funding Muslim movements ideologically close to Hamas, like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria, organizations with which Hamas has a strong ideological affinity. And of course, uh, Qatar was also heavily involved in financing the resistance, some of the resistance forces to uh, Muammar Gaddafi's government in Libya. And of course, some of the people that uh, Qatar funded there also were people with an ideological affinity to Hamas. So I, anyway, I suspect that this is an important country in this conflict area. And of course, Secretary of State Blinken is visiting, is going to be visit, visiting it. This news that Blinken is indeed intending to visit these countries is welcome, but it is very belated. It has happened a week after this crisis began. It seems to me that the United States is playing catch up. And of course, the Europeans, to all intents and purposes, are nowhere in sight. But anyway, let's move on. Because even as Secretary of State Blinken was making these calls for restraint or apparent restraint in Jerusalem, the Israeli government was informing the United Nations that it wants around 1.2 million people in northern Gaza to evacuate um, from northern Gaza to go apparently to southern Gaza. The Egyptian government has made it quite clear that it is not prepared to allow these people to enter its territory and anyway to relocate from one part of Gaza to another in other words. Now According to the United Nations, the Israelis said that they wanted this all done within 24 hours, which is an impossible timetable. There aren't the coaches, there aren't the facilities either to move or house or feed these people, especially in the context of a Israeli electricity, water and flu food blockade of the entire Gaza region, asking thousands of people, millions of people, to leave their homes in that kind of way over such a short period would, as US, UN officials correctly said, guarantee a humanitarian catastrophe. Well, perhaps because there may have been some private pushback about this, maybe from the United States, maybe from European officials. The Israelis then issued clarification, saying that they had not provided a deadline, a 24-hour de deadline for this relocation to take place. Though I noticed that they didn't make clear by which date they thought it, would, it should take place. But they continue, apparently, to call for these hundreds of thousands, more than a million people, to leave their homes and to relocate to southern Gaza. Hamas, for its part, has told these people to stay where they are. Now, all of this, whilst Israel continues to bomb Gaza, and I've seen reports that Israel has dropped already uh, hundreds of bombs on Gaza, many of them striking, obviously, residential civilian targets. This is a densely populated city. The idea that one can drop a bomb on part of it and not cause enormous devastation, which will affect civilians, well, that is impossible. Now, my own personal view about this is that the Israelis understand perfectly well that there is no real possibility of transferring people 
a million people from one part of Gaza to another in a 24-hour period or in any time period that would not involve several weeks. And my sense is that Israel's um, plans do not extend to waiting for several weeks or even months in order to allow time for such an evacuation to take place. I think what has happened is that the Israeli government, having been asked by people like Blinken and no doubt other European officials, and having been warned that some of the actions it's been preparing to take with respect to Gaza could be construed, in fact, in my opinion, unquestionably are violations, serious violations of international humanitarian law. I think that the Israelis made this call for an evacuation of people from northern Gaza in order to give themselves some cover for when whatever kind of military operation it is that they plan begins when and uh, civilian casualties start to increase. They can say, well, they did what they could. They asked for these people to leave, and this didn't happen. And the result is that the fighting is taking place around them, and that is why they're dying. Now, that may sound rather cynical, but it is not the first time that governments have done this sort of thing. The Israeli government has shown its share of cynicism in, it, in the past, but if we are going to be frank, so have many other governments in similar situations or in analogous situations before. So that is what I think. There is, of course, another compelling reason why I think it is most unlikely that large numbers of people in Gaza will leave their homes in the way that the Israelis want them to do. And that is, of course, because doing so plays into the intense fears that exist right across the entire Palestinian community, that if they do leave their homes in that kind of way, given the events of 1948, when millions of Palestinians left the territory of the British Mandate of Palestine and became refugees in various Arab countries and remain refugees still, as do their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Given that those events, the events the Palestinians called the Nakba, given Israeli settlement activity on the West Bank, I think most Palestinians believe that if they did leave their homes in Gaza, the Israelis would never allow them to return. That another part of the territory of historical Palestine would be lost and would be lost irretrievably. So for that reason, quite apart from Hamas's demands or orders, if you prefer, I believe that most people in Gaza will stay and will face what comes. Now, as to what exactly will come, well, that remains to be seen. Um, there, is, there are continuing warnings from all sorts of people against the risks of a Israeli ground offensive. There are lots of warnings about what might happen if Israel acted in such a way that it appeared to be using overwhelming or indiscriminate force against the civilian population in Gaza. Even individuals like Ben Wallace, 
the former British Defence Secretary, who can, in no conceivable sense, be said to be anything other than pro-Israeli. In fact, he's written what I find a frankly deranged article in the Daily Telegraph, which appears today. Anyway, even he seems to understand that an excessive Israeli reaction, a disproportionate reaction, I appreciate many people in Israel would not accept that any reaction is disproportionate after what Hamas has done. But anyway, an action, a response which would be perceived across the Arab and Muslim world as extreme and disproportionate, then that would play into the hands of Hamas, or as people like Ben Wallace like to think, um, Israel itself, uh, Iran, is Iran as well. And he talks at length in this, as I said, Ben Wallace in this bizarre article about how um, Iran is seeking to capture the Arab street, in other words, sentiments amongst Arabs, in order to establish itself as the superpower of the Middle East. I think that, um, I think that is, as I said, a preposterous theory altogether. But anyway, even he is saying that it is essential, therefore, for Israel to act with circumspection. And even he seems to understand that a military operation by Israel in the Middle East, sorry, in Gaza, could very well become protracted and very difficult for Israel, that it might lead to extensive loss of life, including amongst Israeli soldiers, and that it might have major political costs. Anyway, nonetheless, as I've said already in programme, after programme now, ever since this crisis began, I think that calls for restraint are certain to go unheeded. We're already seeing, as I said, a major bombing offensive of Gaza underway. And I, for one, think that it is now a certainty that some kind of ground operation by Israel in Gaza is going to happen. I don't think there's anything that anybody can say or do which can stop it happening. And I think in Prime Minister Netanyahu's case, if it doesn't happen, his political position in Israel will become untenable. Now, on this topic, I do want to return briefly to the widespread view that many appear to have that Prime Minister Netanyahu intentionally looked the other way. As warnings of a Hamas attack started to spread and um, that he disregarded intelligence that there would be such an attack and that he to some extent manipulated or orchestrated this event in order to secure his own position in the face of the protests and the criminal investigations within Israel of which he has been the t a target. I personally don't agree with this. I think that this affair has over the long term, more probably undermined Prime Minister Netanyahu's position. In this, I am in agreement, by the way, with a piece written about this, um, these events by Seymour Hirsch. And Seymour Hirsch says that a former US intelligence officer has told him this. I, I tend to agree. Prime Minister Netanyahu's major selling point to Israelis has been, or one of his major selling points to Israelis, has been that he has made Israel and Israelis secure. And the 
the, the events of the last week have catastrophically undermined that perception. And on top of all of this, I think that he is now, in effect, himself trapped, because given how his position has been weakened, if there isn't going to be a ground operation against Hamas in Gaza, I can't see how he can stay in power. And if there is such an Israeli ground operation in Gaza, and if it fails, then again, I cannot see how he can stay in power. He is, in effect, compelled as a fact of political survival to carry out, to order such an operation. And his entire political future and his prospects, perhaps, of staying out of prison now depend entirely on its success. And I can't personally see how that means that today he is in a stronger position than he was 10 days ago before this event took place. I would just add in parenthesis that my own sense is that Prime Minister Netanyahu's relations with the senior officers of the military and with Israel's intelligence services has been poor. And I am fairly sure, in fact, I'm confident that if intelligence information had been passed on to him by Mossad and Shin Bet and the other parts of the Israeli intelligence apparatus, warning him that something like this was coming, I cannot believe that we wouldn't have heard, seen strategically placed leaks appearing in the Israeli media telling us that this was the case. And in fact, given the kind of society Israel it is, this would have been a matter of massive public debate and argument and recrimination. And I think Prime Minister Netanyahu would already, in that case, be in very serious trouble indeed. And I doubt, in fact, that he would still be in power. But anyway, those are my thoughts. I don't want to dwell too much on Prime Minister Netanyahu's position, because to be truth, truthful, I think that any other Israeli Prime Minister of any party who took power now would find that they have little choice but to launch some kind of big military operation against Gaza. Um, I think the political pressure within Israel is enormous, and I don't think any political figure in Israel is going to resist it. Once upon a time, Israel had leaders like Ben-Gurion or Golda Meir, who might have been strong enough politically to resist that sort of pressure. I don't believe that is the case now. Having said that, despite my absolute confidence that a ground operation or some kind of military offensive against Gaza is going to take place, I still think it is only appropriate to point out that it is a mistake and that the consequences of it could turn out to be very negative for the future of Israel as well as for the greater Middle East. Anyway, there we are. We will have to wait and see what is going to happen. There's been much talk by many, many people about the deficiencies of some of Israel's weapon systems. I've been reading articles now, several which appearing in many different places, including, by the way, one in um, published by an Iranian news agency. I don't know what value to place on it, but many, many articles now saying that what this, the events of the last week have done is exposed the weaknesses and limitations of Israel's air defense system. 
that its Iron Dome has fallen well short and that um, not only is it unable to prevent missiles, Palestinian missiles, penetrating deep into Israel, but that the rate of launch of missiles by the Iron Dome that this situation requires is unsustainable given the ability of Hamas to launch more and more missiles at Israel, easily produced in cheap and simple industrial facilities such as exist in, in, um, in, in Gaza. And I've also seen a report that in the event that Hezbollah, the Lebanese militia, were to become seriously involved in the fighting up to this, which up to this point, they've been careful not to be. Well, apparently Hezbollah is believed to have an arsenal of 150,000 missiles or rockets, which would surely, if true, overwhelm whatever Iron Dome system um, Israel has. It's difficult to imagine that it would be able to withstand barrages of missiles out of a stockpile that size. Anyway, there we are. That is the situation as of, as of the time of making of this programme. I am sceptical that we're going to see large numbers of people, as I said, move from northern Gaza to southern Gaza. I don't know when the Israeli ground offensive will begin. Israeli airstrikes continue to happen. The emotions remain extraordinary, extraordinarily high. The rhetoric continues to be out of control. There are no restraining voices to speak of on the part of the Uni European Union, which has again catastrophically failed, or so it seems to me, in this matter. And the United States has issued some mild words advising Israel to show restraint, but there's no sign that it is acting, exerting itself to any degree in order to try to rest restrain Israel uh, effectively. And by the way, I think the one thing that might make a difference, might persuade the Israelis to hold back, would be an urgent demand from the United States that they desist, that they, that they exercise restraint in this situation. But I've seen nothing to that effect. And as I said, in terms of dis diplomacy, the United States appears to be playing catch up. And Continuing a little with the United States, its overriding response, its key response to this uh, conflict seems again to be less diplomacy than waving the big stick. hundred years ago, more than a century ago, a former US president, Theodore Roosevelt, talked about how the United States, its conduct of diplomacy would be to talk soft but carry a big stick. The United States now talks very, very loud, very belligerently all the time, and it still waves the big stick. So it's not completely reversed on what Rose Theodore Roosevelt used to say, but it's only following part of his advice. It doesn't talk very soft anymore, but it continues to wield the big stick and carry a task force is now in the eastern Mediterranean. Presumably that is intended to intimidate Hezbollah in some manner and perhaps Syria also. Why it would do so, I'm far from sure. And apparently Another carrier task force is steaming towards the same region. Some say it's intended to go to the coast of Iran. My own view is that these military deployments 
well, they might have some deterrence value, but they might also be seen as provocative and could perhaps even provoke further reaction. They do not substitute for proper diplomacy. The more appropriate thing for the United States to be doing in this sort of situation would be to talk directly to Iran and to see whether the United States could work with Iran to bring this situation under control. Because in contrast to Ben Wallace, far from Iran appearing to me as being the puppet master pulling the strings and controlling these events, I get the impression that the Iranians themselves have been taken by surprise and also wish to prevent an uncontrolled spiral into war in the Middle East. Well, that may be right or it may be wrong, but the best way to find out, surely, would be to talk to the Iranians. But of course, no senior official of the United States government up to this time, not Biden, not Lincoln, is able publicly to do that. No doubt, secret discussions, private discussions between middle-ranking officials are taking place. But experience has shown that in order to conduct effective diplomacy between states in this kind of crisis, it must be undertaken at the highest level, preferably between presidents, and if not between presidents, then at least at the level of foreign ministers. And for the moment, at least, not only is that not happening, but it is most unlikely to do so. Anyway, there we are. As I said, this is a crisis in which the events that will probably happen over the next couple of days and weeks have now, to a great extent, already been scripted. And I doubt that there's very much that anybody can say or do, or seems willing to say or do, to change course. But anyway, that's the situation on the ground. Now, yesterday, I spoke about the intense levels of diplomatic activity that have been going on. I understand, by the way, that there's been more discussions now, this time between the Russians and Turkey. And no doubt we will see a great deal more. But the Russians, who are perhaps the only party at the moment which is prepared to set out a position as to the potential way forward. Anyway, they have been speaking. And again, the person who has been speaking most clearly is President Putin of Russia. And he has done this at a summit meeting of um, leaders of the Commonwealth of Independent States, this shadowy, ephemeral organization created by, basically by Boris Yeltsin and his team after the Soviet Union collapsed, which was intended or was supposed to substitute for the Soviet Union in some form, but which never really did. Anyway, this organization still exists, though, as I said, it's become increasingly shadowy, um, and it's holding a meeting in Bishkek, in Tajikistan, or, or, um, or sorry, in Kyrgyzia, and that is where Putin has been speaking. Before I leave that, I should say that Putin, again, had many interesting things to say about economic integration processes within the Commonwealth of Independent States, within the territory of the former Soviet Union. And I saw that one particular political leader who attended this summit meeting and with whom Putin seemed to be getting on extremely well 
and who now seems to be increasingly becoming a full member of the team, was Ilam Aliyev, who is, of course, the president of Azerbaijan. Pashinyan of Armenia, unwisely, in my opinion, appears to have been away. I say that, I'm not absolutely sure that he was away, but I've seen no pictures of him there, and he's not on any list of the attendees that I have seen. Anyway, put all that aside, let's discuss what Putin said about the current conflict in the Middle East, because it is interesting and it is important, and it follows on directly from what he has been saying recently in various other formats. And I should say that the, these, this was said in prepared comments um, at the start of the plenary meeting of the Council of Heads of State of the members of the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States. So these words are scripted. And this is what Putin said, I cannot help but say a few words about the unprecedented escalation of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. What happened, the massive tragedy that Israelis and Palestinians are now experiencing, was a direct result of the failed policies of the United States in the Middle East. The Americans, with the support of their European satellites, notice this incredibly disrespectful language that Putin is now using to describe the Europeans. More and more countries are thinking in the same way, by the way. Josip Borrell, the high representative for uh, foreign affairs of the European Union, who is on a trip to China, perhaps he would have been better advised going to the Middle East, but anyway, he's on a trip to China. Um, he's apparently complained there that the Chinese are not taking Europe seriously, despite the EU's immense geopolitical significance. Well, we can see that it's not just the Chinese. The Russians aren't taking the Europeans seriously either. But anyway, going back to what... Putin said, the Americans, with the support of their European satellites, tried to monopolize the process of Middle East settlement, but were not concerned with finding compromises acceptable to both sides, and certainly never took into account the fundamental interests of the Palestinian people. Now, here he is, Putin, once more, speaking very straightforwardly now, much more straightforwardly than he has done in the past, about the fact that the interests, the fundamental interests of the Palestinian people have been neglected. Up to very recently, he has attempted to exercise a degree of equidistance between the uh, Israelis and the Palestinians. He's always sought to maintain good relations with the Israelis. He's had a good working relationship with the Israeli Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu, but now increasingly he is hardening, the, the Russians are hardening their statements, they're making clear their disagreement with US policy, and by the way, Prime Minister Netanyahu's recent policies, um, and are making it increasingly clear that they see the origins of this crisis in the fact that the Americans neglected and the Americans, and of course by extension the Israelis, neglected the fundamental interests of the Palestinian people. Now, John Helmer has written another excellent article on this issue on his website, Dancing with Bears, and he's pointed out that in Russia, opinion polls, which happen regularly with Russia, are steering very well clear of asking for the asking Russians about their opinions about this whole conflict. And Helmer, who has an unrivaled knowledge amongst journalists of Russia, says that the most likely explanation for this 
is that the pollsters and the Kremlin don't want it to become clear that public opinion in Russia is increasingly shifting away from Israel and is becoming increasingly sympathetic to the Palestinians. It's another very interesting article by Helmer and one which repays reading. But anyway, Putin is now talking more explicitly than he has done in the past about the Palestinian people. Um, whatever pro-Israeli sentiments he has or have, which have been attributed to him, he's now explicitly <coughs> sorry, <laughs> explicitly becoming more critical of the American and Israeli positions and more sympathetic to the Palestinian ones. And then Putin goes on to say, the one-sided line of the Americans for many years led the situation further and further into a dead end. The Middle East Quartet of international mediators, one of which, by the way, is Russia, was not used under flimsy pretexts. The United States actually blocked this format, which was unique and which, by the way, had a mandate approved by the relevant UN resolution. In general, an attempt was made through certain economic incentive measures to solve a political problem, a deep-seated problem, namely the creation of an independent Palestinian state, basically through improving people's, Palestinian people's material conditions. And all of this, this neglect, in other words, of the underlying political problem, along with Israel's settlement activities, led to today's tragedy. By the way, we are hearing, we will probably talk about this later in an informal set setting, about plans to prepare a ground operation in Gaza. In other words, about the Israelis marching into Gaza. You and I, and of course he means by that the leaders, of the other states that make up the Central Asia, the, the Commonwealth of Independent States, most of which, by the way, are Muslim states. The Central Asian states are all Muslim. Azerbaijan, of course, is also a Muslim state. You and I understand, to put it this way, semi-professionally, that the use of heavy equipment in residential areas is a complex matter fraught with serious consequences for all parties. And without equipment in the same residential buildings, it is even more difficult to carry out these operations. So what Putin is saying is that we're all people with experience of war. Azerbaijan has had recently. We, of course, have had in uh, Ukraine. We're having it at the moment in Ukraine. But all of you have some knowledge of what I'm talking about carrying out a ground operation, street by street, clearing houses of entrenched Hamas fighters, trying to smoke them out of tunnels and bunkers and whatever it is that they built there, without heavy equipment, is incredibly difficult and would cost enormous numbers of losses on the part of your troops. But using heavy weapons, while that might expedite the affair, and might reduce your own casualties, will inevitably lead to a massive increase in casualties on the part of the civilian population. And then he goes on to say, the most important thing is that civilian casualties will be absolutely unacceptable. Almost two million people live there. So he's saying effectively to the Israelis, he's being, again, obviously careful in his use of language, he doesn't want to burn his bridges with the Israelis entirely, and we'll see in a moment why. He's basically saying to the Israelis, don't do this thing. It's going to result in heavy losses to you and enormously heavy losses to the civilian population. And that is something that is unacceptable. Unacceptable not just to me, 
not un unacceptable, not just to the other leaders of the Commonwealth of Independent States, but to global opinion around the world. And then Putin goes on to say, now the main thing is to stop the fighting. And this is where it becomes interesting. Collective efforts are more needed are more than needed in the interests of an early ceasefire and stabilization on the ground. Collective efforts. Collective efforts by whom? Well, let's wait, let's just get on and see what he has to say. I would like to emphasize Russia is ready to coordinate with all constructively minded partners. Now, yesterday, I said that there have been intense negotiations, discussions by, uh, between the various BRIC states, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, and of course the Turks have also been spoken to. There have also been a conversation between Putin and Erdogan, and apparently there's another one being prepared, and President Erdogan is now talking about sending humanitarian relief supplies to Gaza. So I said yesterday that all of that pointed, in my opinion, towards a concerted effort by the BRIC states to put together some kind of peace proposal, some kind of ceasefire proposal together, and we would probably see that start to coalesce and take shape at some point over the next few days or weeks. And you see here Putin is in effect telling us that that is exactly what is going on. And then he goes on to say that it isn't clearly not just intended to deal with this particular crisis, but that it is going to look ultimately for a long-term sustainable solution to this whole problem. We proceed from the belief that there is no alternative to resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict through negotiations. The goal should be the implementation of the UN two-state formula, which involves the creation of an independent Palestinian state with its capital in East Jerusalem, coexisting in peace and security with Israel, which, of course, we all see this, was subjected to an attack unprecedented in its cruelty and which, of course, has the right to protection to ensure its peaceful existence. So he's saying, yes, you in Israel were subjected to an attack unprecedented in cruelty. We absolutely accept that. We are, we wholly oppose what was done. But the solution, the long-term solution to this problem is not to be found through the kind of ground operations in Gaza, which you are planning in Israel now. The long-term solution and your security, your right to protection, can only be achieved through a proper political settlement of this conflict. And he then goes on to say, we need to be concerned about resolving this issue through peaceful means. In this situation, in this place, it seems to me that there is simply no alternative. I would like to emphasize once again that Russia sincerely values historically strong, friendly, truly trusting relations with its CIS partners. So that looks like an invitation to the other states attending this meeting to join with the Russians in this attempt to try and broker a ceasefire and achieve some kind of peaceful resolution. Now, a number of points need to be made immediately, which is that the Russians by themselves do not have the diplomatic and political weight to push through a ceasefire or a negotiation. The BRICS states collectively might be in a stronger position. 
and most of the BRICS states would appear to be in agreement about this. But one particular BRICS state, which is China, the most powerful by far, has for the moment avoided commenting extensively about this matter. One gets a sense that the Chinese are intentionally taking a back seat, as they so often do. And there's lots of reasons to think that in reality, the Chinese are much more active behind the scenes than appears to be the case. I personally think it is inconceivable that the Russians and the Chinese, for example, have not been talking to each other. They do regularly, but of course only a fraction of their discussions are made public, and there's clearly been a decision that in this case they should not be. But I am sure that China and Russia have been in talks, and I suspect that the Iranians and the Saudis, both of whom have very close and friendly relations with China, have also been in discussions with the Chinese about this issue as well. And it's likely that at some point over the next few weeks, we will see some kind of coming together of the BRICS with the Chinese, and by the way, India also, playing a leading role in trying to come up with some kind of proposal. Importantly, all of the BRICS states, China, India, as well as Russia, as well as the new entrants, Iran, Brazil, sorry, Brazil, of course, also South Africa, but also the new entrants, Iran, Saudi Arabia, appear to be singing from the same page on this. So it should not be too difficult, in theory, to come up with a proposal. But I also suspect that the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and the Egyptians and the Saudis and all of those understand very well what I have or what I also believe to be the case, which is that there is no realistic prospect at the moment of stopping this military incursion, this ground operation by Israel into Gaza, or in the absence of that, this blockade of Gaza and this bombing campaign against Gaza. I suspect that what is going to happen is that the BRIC states are going to be working quietly with each other, talking to each other, working out what their proposal is going to be, allow events in the meantime in the Middle East to take their course, but trying to ensure that the war doesn't spill over to include Hezbollah and Syria, and in other words, trying to contain this thing because they do not want an uncontrolled escalation, but waiting for events to take their course, waiting to see whether this ground operation succeeds, and if instead it becomes bogged down, that is when they will make their move. And they will probably come together, they will propose a ceasefire, they will propose humanitarian relief, they might conceivably come up with a proposal for the deployment in Gaza of a peacekeeping force. This was floated by someone on a live stream I did for locals, though I would guess that Hamas might not be welcoming of the idea of the presence of such a force. But anyway, something like that might happen. I suspect that that proposal would be put to the Israelis, and to the United States, if the US and the Israelis rejected it, the BRIC states would presumably propose it to the Security Council, the US Security Council. 
if the United States and the Western powers vetoed it, I think that there is now a serious chance that the BRICS states would take it to the collective, to the General Assembly, and I think there it would pass. Now, General Assembly resolutions are non-binding unless they are made within the structure of the Uniting for Peace formula. There might not be the votes in the General Assembly for something like that if it were done in defiance of the United States. And I'm not sure anyway that the Chinese and the Russians and the other BRICS states would be prepared to go that far. But one way or the other, a resolution of the General Assembly, backed by what I am sure would be a majority, would be a major political defeat for the United States and for the Western powers over the course of this crisis. I think that is what is coming. And the plan, clearly the Russian plan, is now to re-engage with the Middle East. Russian policy, basically since the 1980s, the mid-1980s, since Gorbachev became leader of the Soviet Union, was to walk away from the previous unqualified support for the Arabs, which had resulted in Soviet relations with Israel collapsing in the late 1960s and with a severance of diplomatic relations. I think the Soviets decided at the time, and subsequently, and the Russians also, that the Soviet Union lost badly out of its overcommitment to the Arabs. The Jewish community in Russia was antagonized. And the Arab states at that time proved unreliable partners from a Soviet point of view. And I think a decision, a policy decision was made probably over time, which basically stuck, which is that the Russians were prepared to take a back seat in terms of the negotiations, the attempts to try to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And then when Putin himself became president, I think that the Russians went even further and looked, in fact, to improve relations with Israel to some extent, at the expense of Russia's policies, seeking a settlement of the situation in the Middle East. But I think that the Russians now have come to a conclusion. Firstly, that Israel, as it has shown over the course of the Ukrainian crisis, is ultimately always going to be aligned with the West. But secondly, that the situation in the Middle East is too volatile and too dangerous in a region proximate to Russia itself for the situation to be allowed to deteriorate there. And I think that the Russians, therefore, have made a decision that they have to re-engage with the Middle East and with the process of settlement of this Palestinian-Israeli issue but based on their previous experiences, they're not prepared to do this by themselves. They don't want to go alone. They want to work with their partners, their partners in the Commonwealth of Independent States, the former Soviet republics, but first and foremost, and primarily, with the other BRIC states. Now, I don't wish to suggest that it's the Russians who are driving all of this from inside the BRICS. I suspect that if there is a single driver, it is most probably Iran. But having said that, it is the Russians who have expressed their feelings, their views about this crisis most clearly and most co coherently. And that is why I am focusing on them. Now, these were Putin's words, but we have seen other Russian officials talk about this also, 
And we have also seen specifically comments now made by the Russian foreign ministry, and in particular today by Russia's foreign ministry spokesman, Maria Zaharova. And she said that um, in terms of the last round, in the escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian tensions, the United States has already done everything they could, and the rest of the world will now have to clear up the mess. That is what Zaharova said, according to TASS, uh, the latest press briefing in the Russian Foreign Ministry. And TASS goes on to say that commenting on latest remarks by White House officials who said the United States was not planning to send its forces in Israel, to Israel to participate in the conflict, Zaharova said, I'd say they have already done everything they could. Now, as always, will, others will have to clean up the mess after them. So that gives us a good insight into Russian thinking, which I suspect will turn out to be BRICS thinking as well, with a kind of diplomatic initiative, which I was talking about. Anyway, we will see what happens. I have spent a great deal of time over these last two programmes discussing what I suspect will eventually turn out to be a diplomatic process that the BRICS are probably currently working on. I don't want to give the impression that this is going to happen tomorrow or today, though you never know. Things can turn out all sorts of strange ways and events might happen that might surprise, surprise us. But I think that this probably is on the way, though I want to stress again that for the moment, in this particular situation, where we are today, no diplomatic initiative is going to be presented, not by the BRICS, not by the Russians, not by anyone else, because everyone understands that the process, the immediate events, are, as I said, now scripted. We are going to see an Israeli military operation in Gaza, and nothing can prevent it. So it makes no sense for the Russians, the Chinese, the Saudis, the Iranians, the Turks, anyone else, to get in the way of that and be effectively steamrolled over. What they're going to do is they're going to wait and watch and see what happens, let events over the next few days, weeks, take their course, if the Israelis do got, get bogged down, then we will see these powerful countries, the BRICS states, begin to take their move, make their move. And that could be difficult and embarrassing for the United States, which, as I said previously, is currently playing catch up, even as the diplomatic processes increasingly get underway. So that is where we are in the crisis today. Um, I'm not sure what Israeli plans are. The Israeli military do not share their plans with me, even though they do talk about them quite a lot. Um, for the moment, as I said, we have bombing raids. We see concentrations of large numbers of troops and machines. My own view is that probably will be a ground operation within the next few days. It might even start as soon as tomorrow. How well it will go, what, will, what it will achieve, whether Hamas is able to resist it, that all remains to be seen. Anyway, Ukraine, sorry, <laughs> Israel Middle East is of course not the only crisis and I'm now going to turn to the situation in Ukraine. And yesterday I talked about the ammunition shortage which is hobbling military actions potentially by Israel 
and increasingly by Ukraine, even as the military situation in Ukraine, for Ukraine, continues to deteriorate. And there was a stark illustration of the existence of this ammunition crisis in an article in the Daily Telegraph, which appeared today. And it reads as, as follows. This is the title. British howitzers fall silent in Ukraine because of catastrophic shortage of shells. Soldiers have been reduced to firing their weapon less than once a day, and some are resorting to using a Second World War era gun instead. That's in the Daily Telegraph. Those are the, that's the title and the, and the subtitle. And then it goes on to say, this is, I'm now reading from this article in the Daily Telegraph. It's there up today. It's by um, Colin uh, Freeman, who is writing this from Kramatorsk in Ukrainian-controlled Donbass. British artillery guns supplied to Ukraine are falling silent in the battlefield because of a lack of ammunition for them, frontline troops have told the Telegraph. Ukrainian soldiers trained by NATO on L-119 howitzers have been reduced to firing them less than once a day because of a catastrophic shortage of shells. One frontline unit said they had ended up, ended up using a Second World War era field gun instead, as it still has sh stocks of shells available. The revelation comes after NATO's most senior military official warned last week that the alliance was fast running out of artillery shells to give Ukraine. The acuteness of the shortfall has now been laid bare by troops from Ukraine's 80th Air Assault Brigade, who received part of a batch of 36 L-119 howitzers supplied to Kiev by Britain last year. Myron, an artillery commander stationed near Bakhmut, told the Telegraph, the British L-119 is a nice gun, very comfortable to work with and accurate to fire, but we don't have enough shells for it. Last week, we fired only five shells all week. It is catastrophically limited. This is him speaking. When we are in battle, we're having to weigh up very carefully whether we should use a shell or not. And the article goes on to say that because of the shortage of NATO issued 105 millimeter shells, and notice these are 105 millimeter shells, it is not even a 155 millimeter gun. There's already an old gun using lighter shells than is optimal for this conflict. But he goes on to say, the, the Telegraph goes on to say, that they have had to fall back on their existing Soviet-era howitzers instead. Amongst them is an ancient 85 millimeter D-44, a Soviet gun used in the final clashes of the Second World War. And Myron goes on to say, it's almost like a museum piece, but we still use it. At least we have more shells for it. This is a critical situation, as this is an artillery war. Not having enough shells costs our own soldiers' lives. Now, the D-54 is indeed an old gun, and 85 millimeters is obviously a seriously underpowered gun by the standards of the Ukrainian battlefield. The major artillery piece used by the Russians is 152 millimeters, and of course NATO uses principally today 155 millimeter shells. So we see shells of roughly 60% of the caliber, of the weight being used, of the caliber being used by Ukraine with this gun. And as I said, it's underpowered, and apparently there's only one of them. And besides, I do wonder what condition the old, these old shells, presumably they're old shells, of this 85mm 
World War II era gun. What condition they're in. Gun shells apparently have a shelf life under reasonably good storage conditions of around 20 years. Now, the Soviets continued to use the 85mm gun for quite a long time after the Second World War, and probably they continued to produce shells for it for some time after it went out of production because it was still in service with the Soviet military. But it can't have been in service for a fair length of time now. I would guess well over 20 years. So again, I do ask what is the condition of the shells being used by this particular gun. Anyway, this art, art, article doesn't ask that question. It doesn't even, and of course it doesn't provide any kind of answer. And then the article goes on. Uh, Miron's comments highlight a long time, a long-standing complaint for Ukraine that it is being outgunned in terms of artillery power by Russia, which uses up to 20,000 shells a day on the battlefield. A single Ukrainian field gun operator can easily use 100 plus shells in a day, provided the supplies are available. And we see that increasingly they are not. Now, we have been hearing and reading quite a lot over the last few weeks, months even, about how suddenly and miraculously Ukraine has obtained an advantage in terms of artillery power, that NATO guns are longer ranged, more accurate than Russian guns, that the Ukrainians are able, therefore, to outrange the Russian guns and have been defeating the Russians with in um, anti-counter-battery uh, work. In other words, in destroying Russian gun positions. Now, some weeks ago, Simplicius the Thinker did a long piece in which he basically discredited that argument, which I have never for one second taken seriously. Um, Brian Boletic has been doing the same on his programmes at the New Atlas. Briefly, it is not true that all NATO guns outrange all Russian guns. There are some Russian guns, particularly Russian 203mm guns, that actually outrange all NATO guns. And it is not true that Russian guns are less accurate than NATO guns. It depends, again, very much on which Russian gun you are talking about. Some Russian guns are less accurate because they are intended for high volumes of fire. Other Russian guns are at least as precise and as accurate as NATO guns are. And in both cases, all guns, whether Ukrainian or Russian, whether Western or Russian, are outranged by each side's um, multiple rocket launch systems. The HIMARS, for example, which is used by Ukraine. The tornado systems, of which there are several types, by the way, one up to 300 millimeter caliber, increasingly used by the Russians, which have similar properties to, you, to the HIMARS system, which Ukraine has been using, but which the Russians have in much larger quantities. Anyway, we've been told, regardless of these facts, that the Ukrainians are winning the artillery war. Well, every so often, as I said, reporting from the front line, when it happens, draws a bit of the curtain, and we see the truth. And the truth is that not only is Ukraine not winning the artillery war, but 
it has run out of shells. Back in the summer, I said that I thought Ukraine would probably run out of shells around the end of August, 155 millimeter shells. I did some rule of thumb calculations, very crude, but I thought that it would be around the end of August, by which time Ukraine began to run out of shells. Well, the United States prolonged that period, or so it seems to me, by providing Ukraine with cluster munitions. They were not, as I suspect, particularly effective, but they did enable the Ukrainians to eke out their numbers of shells by a few more weeks. But judging by this article in the Daily Telegraph, we are now close, or perhaps have now reached, the end point of that. Ukraine hasn't enough shells for its guns. To reiterate again, this article is about 105 millimeter guns. There is no reason to think that the situation with 155 millimeter guns is any better. Every day, the Russians publish information about the number of Ukrainian guns they destroy. And this has been, as I've discussed in recent programs, in some respects, the main story in the daily bulletins that the Russian Defense Ministry publishes. And in fact, the Russians have been destroying large numbers of Ukrainian guns, both Soviet-era guns that Ukraine still has, and also Western guns, which have been supplied by the West over the course of this war. But putting that aside, even if Ukraine still has a significant number of guns, which it may do, it can't use them effectively without ammunition. Now, the Russians understand this, and of course, from their point of view, it is important to make sure that the Ukrainians aren't able to rebuild their stockpile. I've discussed many times how the Russians are in the process of carrying out a massive build-up of their forces. Dmitry Medvedev, the deputy chair of Russia's Security Council and deputy head of Russia's Military Industrial Commission, which supervises the work of Russia's military industries. He's now said that the total number of men who have joined the Russian armed forces as contract professional soldiers, or alternatively as volunteers in various volunteer formations, has now reached 357,000 which means that we are now close to reaching that target figure of 400,000 by the end of the year, which the Russians have set for themselves. And, of course, there's no reason to think that Russian recruitment is going to stop after the end of the year. It could very well be that the Russians are planning to recruit still more men in January and February, and even beyond that. So anyway, there is a major recruitment process underway. The Russians are continuing to build up their forces. They're still churning out tanks and armoured vehicles and all of those things. And of course, they're increasing their numbers of shells. And if the stories about importing shells from North Korea are true, and I retain some scepticism about all of that, but if that is true, then they are also stockpiling shells in huge numbers. But on the assumption that the Russians do want to go on the offensive eventually and launch a big offensive, or perhaps series of offensives, which will end this war once and for all, they do not want the Ukrainians to gain a breathing space, time in which they can restock and resupply and build up reserves again. And that explains these various Russian military operations that we are seeing. 
Even the Institute for the Study of War, as I have said, now admits that the Russians are on the attack in every area. In Robotino Verbovoye, in the south, in the Vremevka salient, in Avdeevka, and reports this morning continue to speak of further Russian advances in the Avdeevka area. There were reports that the Ukrainians made several attempts to counterattack yesterday, trying to push the Russians off this giant slag heap that I was talking about yesterday, and that they've been trying to push the Russians back in all sorts of other places where the Russians have been advancing. It seems all of these attacks were unsuccessful. The Russians have consolidated their gains, and reports this morning suggest that they're pushing forward again. Now, Russian reports continue to speak of an operation to encircle Abdeevka. And quite plausibly, that is what the Russians are doing. But I would suggest that beyond all of that, the strategic calculus is not just to encircle Avdeevka, or perhaps not even to encircle Avdeevka. It's not to break through the Oskol River, even though perhaps the Russians will break through the Oskol River and take Kupiansk and Izium and all of these places. It is to keep up the pressure on the Ukrainians all the time, causing the Ukrainians to deplete their reserves, to throw in more and more of their reserves, to use up whatever limited ammunition stocks they have left, to have no time to build up their ammunition stockpile, no time to retrain, to re-equip, to reorganize, so that when the big blow eventually comes, the Ukrainians will be in no condition to resist it. That, it seems to me, is the Russian plan. And we see that it is being executed systematically and methodically right across the front lines. Now, it's a straightforward plan. The Russians, as my colleague and friend Alex Christoforo said in a video we've just done on the Durand talking about the situation in Ukraine, um, as he pointed out, the Russians have not even made any real secret about it. But people in the West don't seem to understand it. There's more reports this morning in the Daily Telegraph about the heroic defence by Ukraine of Avdeevka. Even though that very defence is in fact making easier Russia's eventual victory. So <laughs> it's a paradox seeing the way in which the war is being reported in the West, paradoxical, because it seems to me that for weeks, months now, for years now, ever since Ukraine was egged on to start its first offensives last year in Kharkiv, and Kherson region, and then with the summer offensive, and then with the defense of Bakhmut, and now with the defense of Avdeevka. Western commentators and Western politicians have been cheering Ukraine on and encouraging it to take action, which makes Russia's victory more certain, and all but guarantees that when it happens, it will be even more complete. Well, I've noticed that President Zelensky has now changed his appearance. There have been criticisms, even from within the Ukrainian military, apparently, that this look that he's had for several, well, ever since the conflict began, of the green t-shirt and the khaki jacket, the Che Guevara outfit, even with Ukrainian soldiers, this is beginning to become um, unwelcome. Um, he's now 
changed all of that for a black costume, at least at the moment. Um, I don't think even that really comes close to responding to the gravity of the situation. And I still see no evidence that either President Zelensky or any of his officials are at all interested in or seeking some kind of peace, some kind of escape from this war. But the trap that they've set for themselves is now closing inexorably. It seems to me also that the failure of Stephen Scalise to be elected speaker makes it more likely that the eventual speaker, whoever he or she is from the Republican Party, will be one who's less sympathetic towards funding for Ukraine, especially given the need to provide funding and support to Israel in its hour of need. Well, given all of this, it seems to me that we are now on a clock that is rapidly closing towards midnight as far as Ukraine is concerned, without its leaders having any real idea of what to do and with the United States becoming distracted by other more serious problems and with Europe itself increasingly adrift. Well, there we are. That's my programme for today. More from me soon. We will see what happens over the next 24 hours in Gaza. And in the meantime, it seems to me that if in the short term in Gaza, the script is now written, at least someone there does seem to be looking for a diplomatic way out, which is more than I can say about Ukraine. Anyway, that's me for today. Let me remind you again, you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X, the former Twitter. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. You can also go to our shop where we are running a sale with a 20% discount and you can buy yourself all sorts of great things, magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me from today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.